Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Good evening. We're very excited to have uh, this event uh, this evening on the Sudan and all the exciting uh, things that are happening in Sudan. My name is Rochelle Davis. I'm a professor here at Georgetown, and I'm also the director of the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies. And I'm here just to open this event because um, we are celebrating at CCAS our 45th anniversary of our existence, but we're also celebrating our 40th anniversary of our Master's in Arab Studies program. And so one of the things that we've been doing this year is highlighting when we bring back one of our, our Master in Arab Studies alumni to speak. And so uh, Dr. Khaled Medani is one of our alums from what year? I didn't even look. Oh, oh maybe I, you don't I, want to I, say. I, I, 1990. <laughs> 1994. So we're really um, thrilled to, to uh, feature uh, our alums, and we will be doing that throughout all of this year. Um, and so I would also now like to introduce uh, Professor Nuruddin Jagnoon, who will introduce the panelists and give us some uh, contextual remarks. Thank you, Professor Davis, for your kind introduction. Um, my name is Nordin Jagnon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, and welcome to our panel uh, on Sudan's popular intifada and the prospects for democracy from revolution to resolution. Our panel this evening is taking place exactly six months after the first panel that was organized by CCAS on March 25th of this year, centered on the following topic, Sudan update, what's happening, and what does it mean? The panel sought to assess the wave of popular demonstration that broke out from the town of Atbara in the north of Sudan on December 19th of the last year and reached the capital Khartoum as the government imposed emergency austerity measures to try to avoid the economic collapse. Two panelists of this evening event participated in the previous panel, Dr. Dima Mahmoud and Ahmed Kududa. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud expressed her optimism with regard to the potential outcomes of uh, the popular mobilization, while Ahmed, if I remember correctly, <laughs> explored four scenarios at the end of his talk. A civil war, the slow and drowning collapse a la Venezuela, radicalism, and the last and most plausible scenario, according to Ahmed, is a problematic and unsafe exit for President Omar al-Bashir in this regard. Ahmed cogently argued that the dictator has become a liability for his generals and change from within was likely to happen. Two weeks after Dr. Mahmoud and Ahmed gave us their assessment on the potential trajectories uh, that the popular demonstrations might take in Sudan, El Bashir was ousted by Vice President, his Vice President and Defense Minister, Lieutenant General Ahmed Awad Ibn Auf on April 11th. Of only lasted 24 hours as the chairman of the Transitional Military Council, TMC, and was in his turn forced out by the seven members of the TMC led by Lieutenant General Abdel Fattah Abdel Rahman Burhan. What uh, struck me the most is the relentless determination of the protesters who mobilized outside the headquarters of the Sudanese Armed Forces and insisted on the transfer of power to civilians. The achievements of the Sudanese people are significant, not just in ending al-Bashir's 30-year rule, but also in standing up to the junta series of intrigues to replace the overthrown strongman with another strongman. The demography of the protesters is another element that deserves to be outlined as people of all ages have been involved in the mobilization with women at the vanguard of the demonstrations. And I still remember the photo of this young woman, David Kandaka, meaning Nubian queen, standing on the roof of the car, chanting and leading the protesters. Her photo, shared by social media worldwide, has become the icon of the popular movement. That is also the role played by the forces of freedom and change alliance as a key actor of the pro-democracy movement in negotiating and signing the power-sharing accord with the ruling military junta on August 17th. The forces of freedom and change allies established 
by the protest organizers and serve as an umbrella to the Sudanese Professional Association, the Sudan Revolution Front, the National Consensus Forces, among other groups. The signature of the power sharing accord facilitated by the active role of the African Union coincided with the trial opening of the foreign dictator for corruption on August 19th. When asked where he lived by the court, Mr. al-Bashir seemed amused by his fate and replied laughing, formerly the airport district at army headquarters, but now Cobra prison, end quote. Neither Ben Ali, nor Gaddafi, nor Salah had the golden opportunity to answer such a question. Perhaps the most tragic event that marked the Sudanese popular mobilization since its inception in December 2018 was the massacre in which more than 120 peaceful protesters were reportedly killed on June 3rd, with many of the victims' bodies dumped in the Nile River. The massacre was conducted by the feared and famous Rapid Support Force, RSF, a heavily hybrid paramilitary force strong of 10,000 troops, controls, Khartoum, made up mainly of former Janjaweed, under the command of General Mohammed Hamdan Dagulu, also known Hamiti, or Himayati, meaning my protector, another nickname gave to him by al Bashir. In 2013, the RSF, as a parallel military structure, was established by presidential decree under the fallen autocratic ruler to coup proof his regime. And I would argue it emerged in the post al Bashir context as the most powerful coercive actor in Sudan. Hamidi himself is an outsider of the Sudanese military elite who evolved from a livestock and camel trader to a warlord, was appointed as a vice president of Sudan's TMC and the main negotiator in the process that led to the signature of the power sharing accord on August 17. Also, it's well known that Hamidi <coughs> has a close relationship with Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Egypt three key, key actors in the counter-revolutionary wave that the region is clearly experiencing since 2013. I hope our panelists will touch upon some of these issues and other, and before turning the floor over to them, let me introduce each one of them. Our first panelist is Dr. Khaled Medani. Dr. Medani is an associate professor of political science and Islamic studies at McGill University in Canada where he is a graduate program director. His published research addresses ethnic conflict, urban politics, and the Islamist movement in Sudan, the question of informal finance and terrorism in Somalia, and the obstacles to state building in Iraq. He has also worked as a researcher at the Brookings Institution and served as a research consultant on humanitarian issues for a number of the United Nations agencies in the Horn, in the Horn of Africa. Professor Khaled will address the background of Sudanese revolution and what led up to it. Second panelist is Ahmed Kududa, who is a Sudanese PhD student in political science at George Washington University, where his work focuses on diaspora politics and rebel governance in post-colonial civil war. In 2019, Ahmed was awarded with fellowships from the National Science Foundation and the American Political Science Association to support his research. Ahmed has been twice to Sudan since the last panel this year and will share with us his valuable insights about the popular mobilization on the ground and its dynamics. Last but not least, our third panelist is Dr. Dima Mahmoud, who is a humanist and activist. Her work contributes to advancing sustainable social, economic, and political development, particularly in Africa and the Middle East. Dr. Mahmoud has co-founded the NUBA Initiative, TNI, a transboundary non-profit organization that leverages art, academia, and technology to protect, preserve, and promote Nubian cultural heritage and endangered languages. Dr. Mahmoud talks with folks on the role of the diaspora in internationalizing the revolution means, Silmiya means peaceful, and goals, Madania, by understanding the civil state as a concept that emerged in the post-2010-11 uh, Arab uprisings, and how that set the stage for foreign engagement 
with the revolution, the people, and ultimately the country during and after the revolution. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Professor Madan. The regional also interest of the African Union is different from the Arab League, which is extremely important. Uh, that is the notion of stability being very, very important. Uh, Ethiopia, of course, plays a central role. Um, and it's very important to understand that the African Union um, changed its mandate uh, with respect to intervention in the context of severe human, human rights violations. And that is that they have a much more forceful interventionist kind of humanitarian mandate than the Arab League, which is still stuck in a particular kind of non-interventionist uh, position that is co-opted, of course, by the regimes in the region. The power sharing agreement, I just wanted to highlight, all of you know of it, of course, uh, but here is where we really have to be very clear. Do we have a democratic civilian government in the making, or do we have a hybrid authoritarian regime? Most countries, even in Africa and the Arab world, undergoing democratization, uh, really um, witness reversals, not completely back to authoritarianism, but in, as for those of you who are interested in political science, uh, it is this kind of hybridity, uh, a mix of democratic institutions and authoritarian institutions. Uh, this is really the majority of regimes in Africa, uh, and increasingly even in the Middle East, are really characterized not by democratic consolidation, um, as is the case of Somaliland, for example, where it's a true democracy, but much more characterized by a mix between uh, military uh, institutions and democratic institutions. So this is really where we find our kind of uh, position and, uh, and status here in Sudan at the moment, which is something that I think we need to discuss. Um, there are uh, two things I want to emphasize, I'm not going to go too long, that stand in the way of democratization and consolidation in Sudan. One of them is the history of the deep state, al-Dawla al-Amiqa, which is very, very important. And one is this uh, factors associated with why uh, uh, regimes in the Arab world in particular <coughs> persist in their authoritarian characteristics. Uh, and of course, there's the issue of the future of Islamism. I'm leaving this really as a kind of point of, for discussion. Um, as much as the Islamist regime, we say, has fallen, so to speak, the important aspect of the popularity of different Islamic movements and parties in Sudan uh, will continue to be part of the process of politics in the country, which is uh, really important to keep in mind. I want to begin with the the role of the deep state, um, and to remember the martyrs uh, of the late uh, 1980s and the 1990s. Kirkis of Coptic background, and Majdi uh, as well, who is Nubian, I think will appreciate this. Uh, this is a period of really the hardening of the deep state, the kind of state that the activists, of course, continue to really try to dismember in very kind of practical ways, but to understand um, why that state is so deep, it's really important to understand previous failures. And I really want to highlight this uh, for the Sudanese in the audience in particular. As euphoric and as positive uh, as these, this revolution has been, I'm old enough to remember being in Khartoum in 1985, many of us are, and there was also similar euphoria, and even uh, many of us participated in the popular intifada that brought down the dictatorial rule of Jafar Mumeri at the time. The transitional period was very problematic for a variety of reasons. One of them was this kind of the really careful manufacturing and manipulation of the electoral institutions. And essentially, the laws were established by the mil military. The electoral college gave a particular kind of uh, quota to urban uh, voters, uh, and the, many of them, of course, the majority were uh, members of the National Islamic Front at the time. And uh, very importantly, and this is very important looking forward, there was no real time uh, for real autonomous political party formation, and that is something very, very important. It is the reason, of course, why you have the opposition insisting on a three-year interim period. Of course, initially it was four and five. All of these things are very important to watch. That is understanding from the past mistakes of democratization in Sudan, which is very different from Egypt and elsewhere. That is, we have to learn from the protests that that occurred in Sudan beginning in 2011. But even more importantly, I would argue, we have to learn from the failure of democracy in Sudan, not only in 1985, but of course, the historic democratic 
um, October Revolution of 1964, which is very important. I'm not going to go into the politics of Tamkin too much, but just really to emphasize what the obstacles to democracy really um, represent and why it's so difficult. I don't want to be too pessimistic, but I just don't want to be, as a friend of mine just today told me, well, there's been a lot of destruction that has occurred in Sudan. And right now, uh, we have to really uh, t really understand the kind of history of, uh, of what the, the Akhwan of Islamists did. Um, there were pillars of Tamkin, the policy of empowerment, and that was basically to use the state itself to accumulate wealth, and most importantly, to set up a patron client system where the state itself would distribute rents to Islamist loyal loyalists. The idea was, of course, to, in addition to, you know, uh, you know, taking, uh, executing people, torturing people, putting them in ghost houses. The idea was to really transfer wealth, and of course, they did that very efficiently. Another very important element was, of course, the kind of co-optation of the bureaucracy, the public service, and as I said, the breaking of any kind of independent unions. And that is why the Sudanese Professional Association is so remarkable in what it has accomplished. Another is, and this is, brings me back to the center here, of course, as I began to do research on the Islamization of the economy, was to really monopolize Islamic banking at the very height of the a boom in the oil boom in the Gulf. And this is where we begin to see a very close economic connection between the Gulf countries and, of course, uh, the, the Bashir regime. Uh, but, of course, what most of you are most familiar with is probably the legacy of this kind of fragmentation of the parallel security sector. The unbelievable um, creation of a host of different uh, security services outside of the state, paramilitaries, in order to forestall what we have seen in December and, uh, and throughout the past six months. And that is to make sure to really uh, crush any kind of opposition uh, from the popular defense forces to the national uh, international security services, the Jamjaweed, of course, the precursor to the RSF, <coughs> and of course the shadow brigades and private militias. Some Sudanese would argue, uh, we, have, we don't know for sure, that they may be uh, upwards of 18 or 20 private militias. These continue to be armed. They are linked to particular individuals from the former regime. Uh, we can actually tell you some of the names. Uh, that is really important. That legacy of the coercive apparatus that is not beholden to the state uh, is something, and of course not beholden to the Sudan armed forces, continues to really mark the legacy of the Bashir regime in Tamkin. I want to quickly talk about how the young people were able to actually undermine this. Um, there are, I'm going to try to go a little bit faster, there are a number of uh, um, obstacles uh, in democratization in the Middle East. This is by way of comparison. We're often asked, how is Sudan similar to Tunisia? How is it dissimilar from Egypt? All of these kind of things. Uh, and believe it or not, as I said, by the time we were working on understanding the protest of 2012 and 13 and 14, and on in Sudan, uh, the majority of those writing about Arab politics thought Sudan would not actually enjoy the kind of a revolution that Tunisia uh, enjoyed, or it would fall the way of Egypt. Uh, and the reason for that had to do with this very dominant conceptual understanding of why authoritarian regimes persist in the Middle East, and that is that their societies are divided, that uh, the political parties and the opposition are very, very weak and often co-opted uh, by the state. That absolutely has been the case in Sudan. Uh, as many of you know, many of the political parties worked in tandem with the Bashir regime. Uh, the rentierism, that is the oil wealth, uh, not only oil, but other forms of rentier exports can actually uh, really separate and give financial uh, power to the state in ways that can feed into the course of apparatus. Um, there is, of course, the really important ingredient of international support. To what extent is France supporting Tunisia, supporting Algeria, Egypt, and the United States, and of course, uh, Sudan and its support from uh, outside powers. Um, another element is, uh, this is uh, very, very important, is this notion of upgrading authoritarianism that is in the context of protest. Let's say in Egypt, you'll see this theater of having elections, right? CC will have elections, so-called. You know, the military council, when they took over power, initially said, you know, we're going to revoke the agreement, but we'll have elections in like uh, 
or was it two months, uh, uh, that notion of liberalizing uh, the political system in order to quiet any kind of protest becomes very, very important. Uh, but as I had written before, and what I want to emphasize is really all of these are important, but really it is the power of the coercive and security apparatus that for me is the most important lesson of the Sudanese revolution and why the young people of Sudan did such a remarkable job and why in many ways Sudan is absolutely exceptional. Of course, I would say the same thing uh, about other countries, depending on the audience, but I think there was. <laughs> Um, I think that, um, first of all, the fiscal crisis of the state uh, is really crucial in terms of the unraveling of uh, authoritarianism in Sudan. It's a very straightforward story, but I also think it's important to, uh, uh, as I said at the beginning, to give credit, credit to, to the youth, and I'm going to do that in a second, but it's also very important to understand that there are other contexts, there are other um, you know, necessary but not sufficient conditions. And in the case of Sudan, of course, it was really um, our neighbor and former uh, brothers and sisters in South Sudan. It really is in 2011 where you see the kind of the unraveling of authoritarianism in Sudan. And that loss of one third of territory, 80% of the oil, it's very, very important. 60% of the oil revenue was going directly into the security apparatus uh, of the Bashir regime. Uh, in addition to that, what is not often talked about is how Khartoum has changed itself demographically. No longer is it dominated by a Riverian Arab elite or Arabized elite. Khartoum really is an amalgamation of people from all over the country, whereas before you'd have the center of a particular kind of elite, and then you'd have people from other regions. The, uh, the city itself demographically, and that played a very, very important role in the organization that we saw. So really, to the backstory of the uprisings then become the erosion of the kind of networks that Bashir utilized in his regime uh, in the oil era that becomes very, very important, um, and the loss even of the northern constituency. Okay, So remember, Akbar is in the north. Uh, this is actually the hometown, home region, of many of the most important loyalists to the Bashir regime. But it's in Akbar that you have the protest. For those of us from Sudan, that was remarkable. Of course, the protest began elsewhere also, to be fair. But Akbara is very important because it was the heartland and constituency of many of the key figures of the Bashir regimes, which is very important. The issue of warfare versus welfare, as many of you know, of course, as I just said, maybe 5% goes into education and health in terms of the national budget, and the rest, of course, goes into military. This is something very, very important because throughout the protest in Sudan, it was very clear every time the Bashir regime said, and Ayas Mantaha would say, well, you rely on your relatives abroad too much, um, and you're living beyond your means. Uh, the response of activists was immediately, well, you're putting 70% uh, of our money into the military, okay? So the notion of corruption was not only a small thing. And also, of course, the kind of, the loss of the support at that time of Arab uh, assistance uh, in the context of, uh, of Sudan, spe specifically the rivalry between Qatar and that, uh, that area. Uh, the, the success of 2008, I think, uh, as I said, was learning from the previous intifadas, but also I want to give credit to all of the iterated protests that youth really participated in. In 2012, partly as a result of the Arab uprisings in the region, 2013, 16, 17, uh, where so many people lost their lives. Um, and uh, very much uh, here, by 2012, I remember writing about how women were taking the lead in the protests in in Sudan, we're often asked why women uh, play such a central role in uh, Sudanese uh, activism, and I'll leave that to uh, the other speakers to speak about. Um, very quickly, I don't want to drag on too long, uh, that uh, we return to the thesis of weak civil society. Um, that is uh, one of the reasons that uh, authors and scholars of the Arab world look at when they try to explain why democracy uh, does not usually occur in the context of Arab, Arab countries. And here I think it's very important to look at the variety of different um, organizations in Sudan. Sudan has always had a strong civil society organizations. In addition to the SPA, the Sudanese Associations and Trade Unions, the youth movements that played a very important role in conceptualizing the very idea of nonviolence. I spoke to one of the founders of Kirifna, 
who said to me just recently that they looked very closely at the text of Martin Luther King Jr. and others who practice nonviolence, which is really important. And uh, the important kind of Nida Sudan that really becomes a very important coalition. And this is where I defend older Sudanese as well as the young. And that is to give credit also to the political parties in Sudan that over the years have worked very hard to try to represent an autonomous opposition. And they remain very, very crucial uh, because, as you know, youth activism is not at yet an organizational, institutional phase. It is still the political parties of Sudan that really are going to determine whether uh, democracy is consolidated. And of course, Nida and Sudan brought all those together. More, um, I think, uh, controversially, is the remnants of the Islamist movement itself. Uh, and, uh, and of course, you have the reformist movement, the splintering of Islamist movement. Um, there's the Ummah Party, of course, the branch of the Ummah Party led by Umar al-Fadil, importantly, the Islam Reformist Party. These are parties that claim legitimacy in civil society and uh, potentially uh, will participate in elections. How do Sudanese feel about remnants of the Islamist project that continues to play an important role in society? We haven't really had that discussion yet because really we're still in, in involved in the do some dos and those kind of things, yes. which I have no problem with, you know, talk, talk about, which is a little bit too hard. I want to really uh, um, talk about the, very quickly the contrasting, um, what I think is remarkable, one of the many things, one of them is the nonviolent aspect and um, why Sudan stands different, not so much from uh, from Tun Tunisia. In fact, when I give this lecture elsewhere, there's usually a part of Tunisia. But let's leave Tunisia aside. Uh, but the, the, the Sunni's case, I would argue, is this kind of history of political protests uh, that predate the Arab uprisings, which really has instilled the democratic political culture in uh, among Sudanese, which is important. When the authoritarian regime in Sudan took over in 1989, I have to say none of us felt it was going to be long-lasting, even though it took three decades. It's really interesting to really, if you remember at the time, it was just seen as another kind of interlude of politics in the country. But for Sudanese, democratic outcomes are really the most natural for a variety of reasons, and that has to do with history. I spoke about the sub-Saharan example, which is really important. And this is important because now we have an increasing number of democracies in Africa who are part and parcel of the African Union, and they see democracy as uh, something that is uh, kind of uh, normalized in Africa as opposed to the other uh, the kind of other uh, Arab countries. For Sudan, I think the kind of coalition across class that is really important, it was not clear to me, I don't know about the rest of you, whether in December the Sudanese Professional Association would be able to link up different social groups and classes. Uh, the activists really did that effectively, and they did it in a particular kind of concerted effort, which is really important. And they were able to, from my perspective and many others, to intervene and correct one of the most divisive elements in Sudanese contemporary politics, and that is the racist discourse that Ahmed Bashir's regime injected in the race war in Darfur, killing 200,000 people, and of course in the Nuba Mountains, uh, without which uh, there can be no, not only peace, but no uh, democratic consolidation. A youth activist over time, this begins at least, and you can correct me, in 2012, when Darfurian students were killed in the uh, University of Jazeera and thrown in the kind of gutter, so to speak, that uh, the youth activists in particular uh, would tell me, we had these focus groups, and they would say, Professor, we take racism seriously. Our in Sudan is not a concept that we used to, in my generation, talk about. We weren't allowed to talk about racism too much. Ethnicity was fine, which is really important. How did they do it? This kind of notion of Silmiya, Silmiya. Uh, many of you Sudanese know of this, but it is just really remarkable the kind of strategies that were employed by young activists to emphasize peaceful protests. That is very, very important. Number one, these pamphlets instructed and enjoined activists uh, across the board to maintain a peaceful, nonviolent, uh, um, protest, which is very important. Um, you know, they may use loud voices and slogans expressing the goal of the regime. That was really important to really, uh, really emphasize. But I like to emphasize this kind of insistence on uh, telling and informing activists that they must include women, men, youth, sheikhs, 
a whole host of people in social in society, which is really important. And of course, here you have the history of volunteerism that begins at least in 2010 with the floods in Sudan, and the, the encouragement of the provision of water and services in order to maintain uh, the kind of activism that happened. There's also information. It's uh, you know you can't have a lecture like this, although maybe they would have benefited from it. Uh, but you have to really give information very, very quickly in order to unify the agenda and to remind people of the, the deep state, right? The Tamkin promises and all of the ijazat of, uh, of Bashir, the kind of successes or the achievements, uh, ironically or sarcastically, um, that really were very, very important. You wanted to inform not only middle class Sunni society, which was the case in previous intifadas, but throughout the regions and throughout the social classes and the neighborhoods, the exact kind of habit that the Bashir regime has impacted not only middle class uh, society in Sudan, but the entire uh, population. What was also remarkable here is how to confront the coercive apparatus. I remember talking to youth activists who said at the time, this is 2012 and 2014, that you had to start to re-strategize a different way of dealing with the coercive military forces. And you had to do it in a very decentralized fashion. You couldn't have a tahrir, and this is why there's a controversy of the strategy of the city itself. And you had to, number one, know where the security you know, offices were in headquarters, and, uh, and at the same time have small protests that were able to really be uh, decentralized in a particular way. And you had to be able to evade. You, you give your message out and then evade security forces. This was something that was already uh, contemplated and really also practiced uh, in the iterated protests that we saw leading up to 2008. Uh, what I also really appreciate because of having traveled to Darfur and, and uh, southern Cote d'Ivoire and South Sudan, and these, or Sudan, we still call it Sudan, is uh, you know we all have our own interesting kind of uh, uh, legacy of the protest. But for me, this kind of cross-regional expansion um, is really remarkable. Um, all of these kind of real important aspect of dealing not only with uniting social groups in the formal sector and formal sector, but also insisting that this was a regional kind of, uh, you know, uh, cross-regional protest, a real truly national protest. Um, and the reason that's important is that what uh, one of the dangers that is ongoing right now, as Alice Duval put it, is that in many ways, Hameti, of course, represents, as many of you know, the kind of divisive policies of Omar Bashir regimes. He himself, uh, Professor Jamnoon, really uh, explained very well the kind of progress of uh, progression of um, the rapid support forces from a paramilitary militia to what we now call a parallel militia that is really uh, in control of the national security apparatus. Right? That took a long time, and it was a result of the war in Darfur. Uh, and that becomes really important. So the legacy of the war in Darfur, as you probably know, has come not only to harm Sudanese, who were perplexed by it, some, which I think is not excusable, uh, but I think that it also really stands in the way of any kind of democratic consolidation. To the extent that, that Himeti has uh, legitimacy in northern Darfur, he also has a lot of gold, gold in northern Darfur. That kind of crisis in the region is central to his own um, ideology, his own program, his own vision, and his insistence that his insistence that he represents the will of the people. You know, that small <coughs> hamlet in northern Cote d'Ivoire. Um, I wanted to have a map of uh, uh, the kind of uh, other obstacle uh, that has to do with international support. If Hemeti himself, and I'm, you know, poses this obstacle to democracy consolidation, his benefactors in the Gulf uh, do as well. The kind of investment of Arab uh, Gulf money is so important. I, there's a map and figures and all of this you can Google, but I wanted to really just highlight what a Saudi um, executive kind of noted, and that is we absolutely look at Sudan as the answer to our problems. It's 350 kilometers away. It should make economic sense, but that infrastructure, that government, a lot still needs to change. Uh, that is really one of the pillars of foreign policy uh, on the part of the Gulf countries, uh, United Arab Emirates 
in particular, but also Saudi Arabia. Sudan is not only f rich in natural resources, it's also an investment gateway into the rest of Africa, and that Africa policy now has become a central, important aspect, and also potentially an obstacle to democratic consolidation, as you know, Emeti is seen as an ally. I wanted to, though, quote, uh, a new performer who kind of in a very nuanced way put it, this war is not due to the rich state elections, the root of this war is land. The Nuba and Fur people are fighting for a return to the old last system, returning it to local ownership. I don't have a time uh, to talk about it here, but this wonderful scholar from Sudanese scholar, Nisreen al Amin, has done a really great research on the kind of impact of these investments for local communities in Sudan. It's not a coincidence that you find in Atbara and in northern Kurdufan, other parts, that you have very strong protests. This does not happen spontaneously. It happens because of investments that displace communities, and that is something that is very important to uh, to highlight. By 2016, the government approved the cultivation of over 1 billion hectares of land in eastern Sudan alone. You'll see the map. The lease is, uh, is uh, 100, what is it, 99 years uh, in length, and each uh, um, acre is less or about 50 cents equivalent. Uh, and there's also no requirement that investors employ Sudanese workers. The effect of that in the region also is really important in devising uh, ways to deal with the uh, grievances in the regional aspects. Um, this is not to say that these investments and the land grabbing are really uh, these, the only uh, problem. Uh, I'm mindful of the Center of Contemporary Arab Studies. However, um, as this uh, kind of accountant says in Khartoum in 2007, in economic terms, the private sites don't trace to land grabbing. They're more the product of a collapsing currency, fuel shortages, and poorly orchestrated subsidy reforms. It's just what the government does. They take people's possession, they steal, steal money, and they ruin everything. Now they've made us hungry, it can't last. I want to really emphasize that one of the important challenges is to generate trust among Sudanese in the regions and elsewhere with the government. So the reason I highlight this quote is that it may not be as significant statistically as uh, as some would say, if you look at the figures of investment, let's say, uh, in, these, uh, in these lands, in the different parts, but the kind of long history of mistrust between the regions and the government, this is why Hamdouk hopefully is focusing on settling these regional disputes first and foremost, uh, because they're much more important for the path towards democratic consolidation than even electoral reform at this point. I want to conclude with the martyrs and Shuhada, which is really important. Um, not only to re remember the martyrs, but at the same time, um, the issues of accountability. Um, we can talk about the problems associated with the authority, the, the power sharing agreement, but what seems to be really left on the wayside is almost um, kind of a compromise uh, of a power sharing agreement that potentially would do away with accountability that would basically um, encourage Sudanese to look forward uh, and not pay too much attention to the historic uh, you know, violence and injustice that has really not only killed so many martyrs in this particular revolution, uh, but also hundreds and hundreds of thousands throughout the country. This notion of accountability, justice, is something that uh, for me right now uh, seems to be problematic because it's being uh, sidelined uh, with this kind of, uh, not only the power sharing agreement, but the insistence on regional actors that this should stick. Uh, so hopefully we'll have individuals that will take it seriously and understand that without accountability, uh, you can't really have democratic consolidation. So that's another obstacle. I'm going to shut it here. Okay. Thank you. So I will briefly, because uh, I, I think uh, we want to have some time for questions, uh, go, I'm going to talk about uh, several things. First, I'd like to thank the organizers, of course, Dr. Rochelle, Dr. Nuruddin, Maddie, and other colleagues who uh, organized this panel. Uh, and uh, Dr. Nuruddin, I will concede that I'm leaving the prediction business. <laughs> uh, I was absolutely wrong. You're absolutely right. Thank you for reminding everyone. <laughs> uh, I think I was being a little too 
pessimistic because of the history of Sudan. Uh, in many ways, nobody really uh, predicted what happened. Uh, obviously not me. I'm going to briefly touch on the nature of the mobilization on the ground, and then I'm going to talk about, uh, focus particularly on the sit-in itself that Dr. Madani uh, highlighted. Uh, and I want to talk about what made it unique and why I think it has actually changed Sudan uh, and Sudanese politics for uh, possibly forever. So of course, as Dr. Mendy said, the mobilization was completely different because it started from the periphery and went to the center. Khartoum no longer represented the heart of what changed politics in Sudan. Uh, the 19th of December torching of the uh, NCP headquarters marked a real catalyst for change in Sudan. Of course, five days after that, on the 25th of December, protests finally entered Khartoum. Now, uh, it was actually somewhat of a coincidence because the SPA, the Sudan Professionals Association, which called for protests on the 25th of December, had done so about two weeks before the protests actually began. Uh, the first Facebook page event uh, actually called for a memo to be submitted to the uh, presidential palace to complain about living conditions and wages. After the protests picked up, it completely changed. It became about the removal of the regime, which was really transformational. Now, between uh, December 19th until April 6th, the mobilization on the ground was really being driven by the street. The SBA certainly did help organize what was going on, but the street became autonomous. There was a new leadership in every single neighborhood. There were young men, young women in particular, who were at the forefront of these protests. I spent, uh, so I was in Sudan in December, I have a Facebook video showing my participation, so <laughs> I was there. Uh, but I also actually, uh, on April 11th, when the coup happened, um, I notified my professors who were very generous and I told them I have to go. Uh, I booked a ticket, I flew to Porto within two days of Bashir's toppling. I had to be there at the sit uh, But the mobilization itself, right, changed drastically. The SBA would send out these maps that uh, Dr. Melanie showed and people would follow the maps to the T, right? But it was only because the street actually pushed back. There would be negotiations with the SPA, which was a faceless, largely faceless Facebook group for a while, and the street, people would go back and say, actually, we don't think the street is the right one to go on. We want you to put the next week uh, protest on this street. And there was this dialogue between this leadership and people on the ground. Now, there were several calls for millionias, or millions march, if you will. Uh, most of them were large, but nothing like, of course, April 6th. April 6th was chosen in particular because of its symbolism with the 1985 uprising, uh, which toppled the long-time dictator Nimeri. Uh, now, nobody really knew if it would pay out. People were kind of scared. Even the SPA hedged its bets. They were hyping April 6th, but there, were always a little, there was always a little asterisk at the bottom. You know, if it doesn't work out, we're still going to keep going. So they didn't know. Nobody did. Now, why was Qiyad al Amr chosen, the, the uh, general command of the armed forces? I think there were several reasons. Of course, Dr. Medin highlighted it was basically confrontation with the military to make a decision and say, you're siding with us, the people, or you're going to side with this autocrat who's obviously outlived his time. But also, the symbolism of Qiyada as the fortress of the revolution. Uh, there, if you drive by, so the Qiyada is in the heart of Khurtum, it divides east and west. Uh, and, I mean, I remember growing up, passing by Qiyada, going to school, you know, we almost feared looking to the right, these soldiers that protected this autocrat. So, it was really this fortress, right? Now, within urban, the urban landscape of Khurtum, Qiyada also represents, you know, the heart of you know, Sudan's heritage of a strong military of this, of this, of this uh, military that's always failed people. Uh, you go, you look at the architecture, it's pretty horrendous actually. You have this building that looks like a boat, 
through the Navy. One that looks like a, I don't even know, like a paper airplane or something. It's for the Air Force. Uh, and each of the different commands of the military has an entrance. Now, people basically decided to go and just sit in. Uh, I was fortunate enough in July to go back and I had a really insightful meeting with Ustaz Faisal Hamad Sadiq, who is now the uh, information minister. He gave me this account of April 6th as this real like, explosion, in the sense that for many people, did, you know, there was no real direction. There were some maps saying people should come, uh, come together here and there, but when people showed up around 11 a.m., there was a lot of security presence, of course, and people sitting there, crossing their arms, looking at each other, not sure if these people are intelligence or security or these people protesters. But like with every single protest, 1 o'clock was the chosen time for the protest to begin. At 1 o'clock, he painted this image of people flooding, these masses coming from all corners of Khurtum to this one central location, this amazing video, just showing, you know, the camera goes, looks this side, thousands of people come, turns to the left, thousands, so they all came in. Now, the sit in itself, right? In fact, the sit in became a sit in a few hours after the protest because people didn't know if it would actually happen. What did this, this, this thing symbolize? In some ways, the territory of the sit in symbolized the first ever social democratic state in Sudan's history. It was a phenomenal thing to see. First of all, you had all the traditional social services of a modern democratic state. You had, first of all, as soon as you entered, and of course, you know, it began glorious and then this kind of faded out, so I'm just giving you the pinnacle of what it was at one given point. There was this slogan of ma'indak shil, lo'indak khut. If you don't have, take from this box of cash. If you have, put something in. So there was cash transfer programs, right? There was free health care. Clinics were set up by doctors, by pharmacists, to tell people, if you're sick, come see a doctor for free, and we'll give you the prescription. You can fill it in for free right here. Uh, there were free public libraries. Street kids were given classes. Uh, free food was given out. Um, for the first six days, vendors weren't allowed in because everything, food was provided by everyone. Free calling. A guy came up to me, he's like, hey, do you want to call your family? Here's a phone. There's free Wi-Fi. It, is, it was glorious, right? They even set up a lost and found. Now, entering the sit-in, um, a friend of mine who... Uh, uh, with whom I went to Sudan recently, Dr. Meh Hassan uh, of the University of Michigan, described the sit-in as a living, breathing organism. In that sense that it had territories, it had, it had boundaries. These boundaries were all uh, basically protected by men and women. They were the guardians of the revolution. These people would ask you to put your hands up and you'll be politely searched. Now, the first few days, that was necessary to prevent security from entering. But after Bashir was toppled, that thing continued. And what it symbolized is that this is almost a protection of the revolution. We're frisking you. I mean, I got patted down. I could have hidden an RPG in my pocket, and they wouldn't have found it. Because it's just it's like, come on in, come on in. But it symbolized this space is safe. If you're here, you're under the authority of the revolutionaries. The Streets of Khurtum, if you've been, are basically mounds of dust from the Sahara. But what you found is people every night, and men and women, would wash the streets. They were cleansing it of its dirt, but also cleansing it as a, as a new state. Um, then there was this cleansing of the oppression of the people, in the sense that there were museums set up. For example, there was the um, 28th of Ramadan Martyrs Museum, where you had pictures of each of the military officers that were uh, killed by the regime, and a family member sitting in front of the pictures, sitting, talking about their loved ones. They were talking, a mother of a, of a person killed would tell the story of her child. And basically, 
this space was representing a catharsis, a national catharsis of just, wow, what's going on? We need to reassess these past 30 years. Now, there was also another phenomenon of people coming in and pledging their allegiance to the revolution. Right? You had delegations from different segments of the society. In particular, elements that were oftentimes <laughs> seen as siding with the regime. For example, banking. The banking industry would come with a delegation. Lawyers would come with a delegation. Uh, the TV and radio in particular, those who worked in TV and radio, they had a lot to apologize for. <laughs> so they came and they kind of apologized. But also people were apologizing for the crimes of their silence. Mm -hmm. As Dr. Madani said, the crimes of Darfur, uh, the crime, the people apologized for South Sudan. For the first time, people said, we are sorry. Uh, and it literally was written, like you saw banners, people apologizing. And then the women. I mean, it, and I, this is really one of the most <laughs> profound things of the revolution. You know, women stood at every podium talking from the morning until the end, not letting anyone silence them. And I'll leave Dima to talk more about it. <laughs> um, quickly, I want to talk about the mobilization and how it transformed. Before the sit-in, the street, as I said, was autonomous. And it was these isolated networks or nodes that weren't talking to each other. They were all communicating through the SPA. And talking to the SPA, and SPA would talk back. But the sit-in allowed all these different people to come in see each other. Oh, your you're guys are from this neighborhood, I'm from this neighborhood, what did you do? People were talking about the heroics of the revolution, and they built trust, and they created linkages that then helped them after the June 3rd massacre. Of course, June 3rd, very brutal. It was almost turning the lights off for this, this moment of catharsis. People were in shock. It was unbelievable. I had left Sudan by that point about a week after before. And, I mean, for me it was very tough, but I couldn't imagine what people there sound like. 120 people killed, bodies, as Dr. Mendy said, thrown on the river. Many more are still missing. The internet was shut off. So this was a real test for three weeks. This framework that people had <coughs> used to make the revolution succeed no longer existed. What were people going to do? They used the networks that they created at the city to actually say, look, we know each other now. Let's pick up the phone. People started picking up the phone and talking and coordinating. They started printing flyers. It was old school activism. It was amazing. They called for Melonia on June 30th. And June 30th was the biggest <coughs> shock to the junta, to their Gulf backers, to the international community. And it was much larger than April 6th. It was this moment where people said, we're not going to be silenced, no matter how many of us you kill. Now, I want to just close very quickly. Um, this new leadership in the street actually, in many ways, is now a real force to be reckoned with. I think that, uh, for example, they really kept the forces for freedom and change honest during the negotiations with the TMC before June 30th, June 3rd, and after the negotiations that started. Uh, they kept on making sure that there was transparency, they were pushing for it, they weren't letting these politicians steal the revolution or talk on their behalf. Uh, they are actually now, I think what we're seeing is they're actually keeping this new technocratic government honest. We see ministers talking to the streets. They're saying, you know, we're talking to the street. We're going to let the street represent uh, what our program is. Hamduk even said it. His national government's program is Hurriya Salam Adala, freedom, peace, and justice. Uh, and I think anyone who rules Sudan moving forward uh, will have to deal with a new level of awareness that has really never been seen before, uh, certainly in Sudan's history, but possibly in the history of, of the region. Uh, both Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. Thank you very much. Thank you. Start by asking everyone to just take a moment of silence and reflect on everything that was said and take a moment to honor the martyrs who allowed for this event to take place.
the reason I ask for this is the core of my topic is how the people of Sudan leveraged the main pillar of the revolution, Silmiya, and turned it into a foreign policy. Can a revolution have a foreign policy? Can a movement have a foreign policy? Can you engage with the outside world if you're not an official government, if you're not a state? <coughs> Yet another angle of the exceptionalism of Sudan, and yes, I'm biased, and it's <laughs> <were> exceptional. <laughs> what is foreign policy? How does a state create a foreign policy? There's a regime. They have objectives. It's influenced by the internal environment. Then you have some external influences. Then, of course, there's the political process itself. Thankfully, I was preceded by extremely knowledgeable and an oasis of um, wisdom when it comes to political science, international relations, and information from the ground. So I won't need to get into that so much. But what I'd like to do is contextualize all of this within the framework of the Sudan Revolution. How did this revolution engage with the international community? And I'm in the habit of now correcting myself every time I say international community, because there is no community within this international system. But how do we engage with this system to acknowledge, to realize that there are lives on the line here there are people who are literally going out to the streets, facing bullets, facing live ammunition, to demand freedom, peace, and justice. And how do you change that into a policy? How do you then activate the human agents to go out and say, no, no, it's not OK what's happening in Sudan, even if you're all the way here in Georgetown? So from a regime's perspective, their objective was the consolidation of power. For the revolution, our objective was Madaniya, is Madaniya. Civilian rule. Not civilian led, civilian rule. So, baby steps, we're taking them. The internal environment was very thoroughly discussed. The corruption, the political situation, lack of employment, the economic strife, uh, double standards of the international system, you name it. But the internal environment of the revolution was very different. Because yes, while the Arab Spring was happening in 2012, 2011, 2012, there was a whole different kind of revolution happening in Sudan, and it was a consciousness revolution. There's a video, if you go on YouTube and write, Our Sudan. I saw that video in 2012, and it is a number of brilliant Sudanese people, some of them my friends, some of them I can't wait to meet and thank and hug for that video. Because it was a discussion of all the things we know are true about Sudan, all the things we know are lacking, but all the things we don't remind ourselves about that we are connected, that we are realizing that racism is becoming too much of an issue, that we're no longer going to accept, that we're no longer going to be silenced, that women will no longer take a step back. The internal environment of the revolution and what started to lead to the revolution was unity, was awareness, was resilience, which is very, very different than what the regime was dealing with in terms of the internal environment. What were the external influences? For the regime, they used these external influences to consolidate their grip on power, the tyranny. They leveraged the double standards of the international, international system which I've spoken about in, in the previous panel, which I believe is now online somewhere. Um, but from the revolution side, the external forces, the external influences, were the counter-revolutionary forces. 
and yes, mindful that we are at the center of contemporary Arab studies, those counter forces were largely Arab. We're hugely Gulf. We're immensely the silence of the so-called international community. Was a media blackout where six months of peaceful, non-violent, absolutely beautiful coming together and unity of a group of people that brought together every indigenous group in that country in one space was just ignored and pushed to the side. Because you can't have creativity and ingenuity and brilliance and music and oud and poetry and art come out of war-torn Sudan, coming out of Africa. It's a question mark. This is what the revolutionaries had to deal with. That those are the external influences that we had to fight while fighting live ammunition, while fighting um, the meddling, while fighting the US weapons that made their way on our land to kill us through Saudi Arabia and through the, uh, through the United Arab Emirates. Why? So more of our boys, more of our men can go to Yemen, can get killed in a war that's not ours. political process to deal with these external influences, to deal with our internal environment, for the regime was divide and conquer. Just like they divided and conquered us as Sudanese, they divided and conquered the international system. For China against the US, for Russia against China, brought the Gulf in when they needed it, turned to Malaysia and India when it was necessary, they went wherever they needed to go. Let go of the South without any compromise. The revolution and the revolutionaries, the political process was different. It was bottom up. It was coming together. It was grassroots. And this is one of the differences, one of the biggest differences you'll see if you study the Sudan revolution and juxtapose it against the Arab uprising. At any given point throughout what is called the Arab uprising, and I refuse to call it the Arab Spring because we are yet to see a flower, except Tunisia, and it's still budding, and we have our questions. Um, is that at some point in those uprisings, there came a split between the ground and the diaspora. And that split for Sudan, alhamdulillah, not yet here. <laughs> You have questions, you have dialogues, you have the intra sudani contention about what's happening on the ground and who's right to speak and who knows and who doesn't. But ultimately, when that media blackout happened, the diaspora took it to the streets. We stormed everything. We stormed the streets, we stormed offices, we stormed social media. We turned it blue. Because it was bottom up because it was about connecting, because it was about coming together, because it wasn't about divide and conquer, because we understood what it meant that, yeah, it's been enough, done. So that formulated a foreign policy because all of a sudden you have this massacre and you have a blackout, but still people are paying attention, people are on the streets, and someone is telling you, to turn blue for Sudan, or to keep eyes on Sudan, or why are you the Sudan revolution? Our foreign policy turned into coming together and recognizing fully that this is Africa rising. This isn't an Arab Spring. This isn't about Bashir. This isn't just about bread. This is about finally realizing who we are. And this is why. Maybe it took a bit longer, but it's being done a lot better.
juxtapose it against the foreign policy of the regime, which was isolationist. Oh, we don't like what the international arena is saying. We don't have to pay attention to them. They leveraged. Again, I gave this example before, and I'll give it again. Who was the first state to call Darfur a genocide? What country was the first country to call Darfur a genocide? Someone yes. call it out. Yes. The USA. Yes. Who was the first country to say no to sending Darfur to the ICC, the International Criminal Court? Yes. yes. The United States of America. Being this divisive is what allowed Bashir, what allowed this regime to maintain and consolidate its grip on power on power and, and, and continue the division. And this is when the timeline goes through from protest in the Nazim on the 13th to Atbara on the 19th, where it went from protest to uprising. Then to the 6th of April, when it went from uprising to full-fledged revolution, which for the record, continues still. Because that agreement is but a step. And that's why, looking forward, how do we continue with this silmiya, with this madaniya, with this coming together absolutely resolute that we are not going anywhere until we get what's ours, moving forward. We remind ourselves first, and you, to keep eyes on Sudan. And this is where the diaspora comes in. Just like throughout the revolution, we've kept accounts. We were forced to bear witness to our own murder, to our own courage, to our own is asking everyone to keep eyes on Sudan and to remind ourselves that there's still many, many more conversations to be had. And yes, it's not going to happen overnight. No one's expecting Hamdok to sleep and wake up and have Sudan be what Sudan is really meant to be, what it really has the potential to be. But we do know that there are conversations to be had. And we deserve transparency. And so in many initiatives, you have so many groups, whether it's the Sudan Diaspora Network or uh, the, um, the Salam Sudan Foundation or the International uh, the Institute for um, uh, Quest for Peace, all calling for ways to keep eyes on Sudan, to engage what's happening on the ground and bring it to the attention of the world. Because Again, just like it was said in the first panel, just like we continue to say, this revolution, this movement, was never just about Sudan, was never just about Sudanese. And this is what you're seeing pick up. Who heard about the revolution in Nigeria breaking out? No? Egypt? The protests in Egypt? Yeah. No one nods. Keep close eyes. And while you're doing it, keep eyes on Sudan, because we have a lot coming. And I'll leave the rest of the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The implications uh, for the transfer of power, I think, within 21 months, yeah. to the civilian yeah. and the organization of <coughs> elections. So can you a little bit elaborate on that? If I mean, we can all elaborate on it. Um, I think we're waiting, was talking to yeah. a colleague yesterday, we're waiting to see the legislative uh, branch, um, you know, because of the 67% is uh, <clears throat> supposed to be from the FCC from the major opposition. It's my friend who doesn't like to talk but knows a lot. We were talking about really the debate being about the representation in the legislative for the armed groups. Um, I don't think that in the talk I emphasized 
uh, because we're talking about the protest, the real story of Sudan and the wars. Uh, and that's really, by exceptionalism, I didn't say, mean to say Sudan is better in any way. <laughs> I, I put exceptionalism in quotation, but I just know it, uh, because I just don't think it is. That was the whole point of talking about the long-term resistance. But um, uh, all countries are equal. So the contentious part is the inclusion, to what extent the armed insurgent groups are going to be included in the legislative branch. Um, Another one is uh, Salahiyat, and these people, to what extent is the military going to use their executive power uh, in this first initial period um, to undermine the civilian opposition and also to embolden their security forces in the military. So there are a lot of contentious uh, aspects uh, of it. I think that uh, hopefully with the inclusion and increasing the percentage of the armed insurgent groups in the legislature, they would represent a really important balance that would side with the civilians. Um, but following that, the interim period is very complicated. Uh, I mentioned the 1985 issue, because from then on, then you have a period of only three years where the legislative has to essentially establish electoral laws, uh, districting, um, you know, uh, political party laws, all of the kind of things that in Egypt did not uh, obtain, even though the Egyptian opposition wanted them to. Remember, the Egyptian opposition wanted to expand the interim period, and that was to deal with issues of political party laws and legislation laws. So these are very technical aspects, and they're only three years to manage this. And this was the reason that the 1985 democracy failed. So as Dima says, we have to be vigilant, but we have to be vigilant very specifically you know, about the consequences and the steps taken by the legislative branch in conjunction with others. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, do you want to add something? Uh, well, no matter how hard Professor Kibnoon tries, I will not make a prediction tonight. <laughs> 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 Any question from, yeah, so, and then, you know, first of all, thank you guys for a great panel today. Uh, so I have a very simple question. Uh, what role do you see, do you foresee the rest of the Arab world uh, playing in a post-revolutionary Sudan? Positive role, negative role, constructive, destructive? Define Arab world. <laughs> Well, obviously, you have the Arab countries that are in North Africa, and then you have the Arab countries that are in Asia, and then you have Egypt, which neither fits here nor there. I can say that because I grew up in Egypt, and I know Egyptians say, we're not Africans, we're Egyptian. We're not Arabs, we're Egyptian. Exceptional. <laughs> All right. Oh no. No. Let me tell you what role I think, personally. Understanding that the call for this revolution is coming from a group of people that have since independence suffered being boxed and divided and divided and boxed into circles and clusters <clears throat> so that each side of us doesn't know what the other is going through. So that when something as horrific as what happens in Darfur happens, the rest of Sudan is so in shock or is so oblivious that we can't actually fathom that's what's happening in Darfur is actually happening, that some of us will go as far as deny it. Some of us will even fall for the lies that that regime was spewing, that it's not that it's not what's going on, and it's just the Western media blowing it out of proportion, and part of it was that. But when you have that kind of um, brutality come to the capital, and the rest of Sudan, which actually at that time was all of Sudan, because Khartoum was at that point decentralized, you had, a, you had the mosaic, you had the Sudanese mosaic in that khayat. And so when that brutality comes, no one can deny it and no one can lie. So now you are dealing with a group of people that understand what it means to be divided, 
and that understand the toll that that has taken on us and what that has to our potential, that is the only thing the Arab world needs to understand. That you are now dealing with a people that will not be painted with one large brush, be it Arab, be it Muslim, be it whatever it is. In doing that, offer whatever help you can or step aside. But I, I want to say also, because it's Center of Arab Studies, <laughs> I'm going to become an Arab nationalist also. I have said, you know, it's all about Africa. No, I mean, there's a difference between Arab states and Arab people. This is really, we have to understand, uh, the Tunisia was very, Al-Azizi was very important. It represented the protest of the regions, the, the, the consequences of economic crisis. Uh, the Tahrir, the city in Sudan, was learned the lesson from Tahrir in Egypt. Right now, Egyptians, uh, if you speak to them, are going to, to just in a couple of weeks, who invited me. To, you know, we're talking about uh, you know repertoires of contention and uh, people and young people, in particular in civil society, who are learning from each other. This has always been the case historically. I get emails from Syrian academics who want to learn more about Sudan. Um, this is just the reality of the Arab world. Okay, so um, I, you know, Africa represents something very specific institutionally. But in terms of civil society organizations, uh, the, the proximity of these countries historically, linguistically, culturally is very, very important. And um, frankly, I have worked in Egypt with activists, youth activists. They don't really deny uh, the, their relationship to Sudan and vice versa. Your, your question should be reversed a little bit and say not what Arabs can do for Sudan, but now what Sudan can do for Arabs. And this is what Egyptians now are talking about. No, it's just a reality. That's just I agree with you, we have to move back. Like beyond uh, the idea of uh, Umid Dunya. Yes, yes. So, 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 so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Uh, my name is Saskania Shafi. Uh, I am from Sudan. I am from Sudan. I am from Sudan. I have two questions. One goes to Professor Mari. Thank you for a very good my question goes with what do you think, what are the active policies to deal with the new state in Sudan? And as you explained it, it is, has an economic branch of it, thousands of companies, and you have different military forces, security forces, <coughs> and it also is in the body of the state, public sector, like the council. And uh, given the example of last two days where they spoil all the food, the fuel in the River Nile, and now there is no fuel, and opening the dam of Rosaris, where the many villages are flooded in, these are all intentional actions to undermine the transition economy. Given that fast, what are the deep action policies that this government currently could use to prevent, but also to deconstruct this system? The second goes to the, my question to, 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 to all of you, which is, when the revolution started and people started chanting on the street, and before that everyone was sharing his personal stories of why this government has to fall down, there was different discrepancies of this demand. People saying, I am in line on the fuel for six hours, I don't find fuel to put in my car. Someone will share, the story of his house and pictures of all his family that bumped in and kept. These are very different grievances, and it is very wide in the, when you see this. Uh, and when I'm seeing the post revolution Sudan, and I'm seeing it in the picture as a person coming from the conflict zone and having a hostile state that use our identity as a selected criterion. So when People are killed in Nuba Mountain in the early 90s, and people in that fall in the end of 90s. The master gas that is being used in Nuba village is made of Iraq. The air pilots that have been used to bomb when they start, when you put the radio FM, that bomb the village in that fall, they were serious. And why this is happening? So for me, the state identity, when we go from here on, and many others is a deep question of, is this a state that deserves for me to be part of it? The question of the existence of the state itself, it is very strong. And now you see the alignment of this 
is very visible seen in the way now looks after the revolution. You have the national consensus parties, you have this army opposition, uh, uh, and you have people asking for investigation and accountability on what was happening inside in the city, and, and you have people that asking for justice and accountability for genocides that happened in those two areas. What do you think that the arrangement, the transitional arrangement that could better well answer these different demands for the future of the Sudan? Thank you. Just since we should try and move out of here at 8.30, do yeah. you want to take another question or two yeah. and then let yeah. the panel yeah. close? I'm just sorry. So uh, if you have another question, that's one. Yeah, go, sir. Aren't you a couscous? What's your name? <laughs> <laughs> I've been reading your stuff. <laughs> um, the question of identity and um, you know whether we describe Sudan's revolution as Arab Spring or not, I mean, has been hinted in this discussion. And, and that also is the same uh, in Algeria. I mean, you know, uh, when you ask Algerians to describe the protest as continuation of the Arab Spring. I think just to, because this is the center of Arab studies, um, the, um, how Arabness is understood in some countries may be very different, is different from how many have understood the Arab Spring. And I think that's very key to understand whether Sudan, Algeria, or other countries, I think the very question of Arabness and how it manifests in um, different countries is, is different. Um, but I think the most important thing, I mean, I don't want to get into a discussion, are we Arab, are we African, are we both, are we, you know, and, and this is a discussion, in, again, in many countries. Uh, it may, might be a discussion in the uh, core access, cultural access of the Arab world, but it is in the periphery. Uh, but I think the most important thing is to understand um, cultural and educational policies. When you have a multicultural state, whether it be Sudan, Algeria, when you have uh, a multilingual state, um, what policies um, create justice? What policies um, um, that uh, will be accepted by the, the general uh, populace? And my question is, uh, um, do you see um, anything that indicates that uh, Sudan uh, is seriously discussing this issue in terms of policy, not so much, you know, Arab Act, but in terms of uh, um, equal, um, just policies to the various uh, groups that make up Sudan. Yeah, I'll take another question. No, uh, Okay, go ahead, Jess. Uh, hi, my name is Jess, and I'm a master's student here at DSFS. I'm a TPS recipient from El Salvador, and so my question is about Sudanese TPS and the Sudanese diaspora in the U.S. Um, as you all may or may not know, the Trump administration has moved to end um, <coughs> immigration protections for African and Latin American immigrants. And so my question is, in terms of diaspora politics, what is the state of TPS for Sudan, and how does the state for TPS, um, the Sudanese TPS, impact democratic consoli consolidation, if at all? Do you have just one question yeah. from, because I quoted her somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> I feel guilty. Did you? <laughs> no, no, I, I don't, it's, I don't have a no. major question. It's very simple. I want each of your impressions on <coughs> when do we exhale? What do we say as Sudanese that we actually have crossed the line? We have met, we reached the finish line, and now we're ready to cross into the next line. And, and, pro and Professor Khalid. Yeah, I have a question. Um, because uh, because Sudan, I come from Mauritania, and Sudan, there are a lot of similarities yes. with Sudan and Mauritania. And, uh, there was an uprising that started actually in Mauritania in 2011, when, but it died very quickly. And what the, you know, the, what the, you know, the reason that you you know mentioned that to the success of the revolution in Sudan, you know, there was an emphasis on civil media, same thing, civil disobedience. There was also Shabi Rudiskatanilam, the slogans. There were so similar kind of strategies that the the protesters employed, but the revolution did not succeed. 
So I'm wondering if the, could the panel could elaborate and what are other reasons that actually that led to the uh, success of the Sudanese revolution. Not beyond the idea of Sylvia and the organization and the, you know, it's because it was similar in Mauritania, what happened in Sudan. I was following what happened in Sudan very closely and it was very similar, but the, the outcomes were different. So we could use elaborate more on it. Um, thank you. Thank you for those fantastic questions, um, especially for the last one because it goes directly to what I was talking about. I think the difference is that the Sudanese people turned Selmeya into their foreign policy. We essentially, whether the world liked it or not, forced them to see what Selmeya means and how we are leveraging Selmeya and saying we are not moving. You can fire your live ammunition, you can let the ginger weed out and have them rape men, women, dead and alive, old and young. We're not moving. The massacre of June 3rd was a direct reaction and response to the humiliation that they were exposed to and that they experienced as the TMC after the civil disobedience. It was specifically after that image that went viral of the aerospace over Sudan. Not one flight. In doing that, the world had to stop. The world had to see, what do you mean they're not doing anything? They are Sylvania. What are you following? What's happened in Mauritania, I would bet, is that the media didn't catch wind of that. And they didn't catch wind of that because there wasn't, unfortunately, enough of a massacre. Because for it to get on CNN and BBC and all of those, it has to fit a certain narrative that all that comes out of Africa is war-torn and diseased. That's the difference. Well, uh, okay. oh, there's another. I think that just to be, uh, I think one of the reasons I put up that slide with the boring list of, of why the revolution worked, um, you know, there's the fiscal crisis, uh, fiscal health of the state, the level of the coercive apparatus. In the case of Sudan, it's really important to be honest, as much as agency is important, that the Sumit youth did uh, accomplish that, the, that, which is really great. You know, the truth is that, that by the end of Bashir's regime, uh, he had lost his patrons. The Arab Gulf countries found him unreliable. He would go to Qatar and then Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates. The United States had already imposed sanctions on him. You know, there was really no, uh, the international level of support dwindled to such an extent that as he, as he went in, in a humiliating way at the end, remember, trying to save his life or save his regime, um, you know, his benefactors really uh, took that away from him. In terms of the sit-in and the massacre itself, we followed it closely. Um, you know, it, it was too much. It was in Ramadan, it was very violent, it might happen. It was the U.S. and AU uh, played a different position this time. And so for Mauritania, unfortunately, part of the equation is the domestic activism. But for our countries, especially in Africa, um, you know, the international uh, linkage is so important. And so you have to really have some kind of alliance. And this is where communities outside, and Sudanese diaspora did. Many of us tried to go to Congress, right? Go to the State Department. We understood that without American support, uh, or at least, um, the, you know, if America supported Bashir too much, then there wouldn't be a chance. Everyone played a role. But I emphasize this because it's too important a point to miss, that you have to mobilize in ways that impresses upon, in this case, the Americans like, you know, Bashir saved, served your purpose, but he no longer does. You know, you want stability, he'll bring you instability. That becomes really important, and it's a very, one of the reasons that there was a success. But in terms of Maysoon, I don't think the notion of, of exhaling is useful. I don't know why we're really interested in the end point. You know, I mean, that would mean that three decades ago, we would we've been holding our breath. 
I think that it's a democracy is a process, and consolidation is defined usually after three elections. Look at Somalia, you know Hargeisa, for example. Would you have imagined that they, because we lived there, remember, in the 19th century, you know, or, or Kenya with its kind of, you know, um, long and difficult, violent uh, democratic uh, history since the 1990s, Ghana, that took a while for it to consolidate its democracy. I don't know the notion, especially with young people, that tomorrow Sudan should have a civilian democratic consolidated government is so problematic and we should guard against that. For your question about pol political sovereignty, uh, I think it was multiculturalism. I think really if you, if you, you know, you have to understand that the young people by the 2012-11 uh, were already constructing a different form of popular sovereignty. If you spoke to young people and the activists, uh, and uh, you know, you, they began, begin to try to conceive of a new understanding of Sudanese citizenship. It happens at the grassroots. So when I'm with them, and this was for many months, uh, they felt very clearly that there was no such thing as Sudanese national identity. There was no such thing as Sudanese national consciousness. And what they informed me is that they had to begin to work from scratch. Those, this is where the slogans come from, right? They come from trying to bring a regional, social, new understanding of Sudanese non-racialized uh, citizenship. Um, that has to be, you're right, that has to be corroborated and institutionalized by the state. Okay, so we have to have a constitution that takes seriously uh, citizenship based not on race and ethnicity as the Bashir regime did in the last later years, but some, one that is truly multicultural. And there are a lot of examples worldwide for the, that, that to be established. Uh, the problem is finally, I should say, that which is related, is that I want to conclude by saying, not pessimistically, but we are still uh, in the phase of what Sudanese like to call not a deep state, but a parallel state, a Dawlunwazia, right? So, you know, uh, this is kind of reflecting those questions, that in this initial period, the state is, uh, is really run by the military. They have executive power. Uh, they, have, they, 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 they still retain the commanding heights of the economy. Um, and as much as we like Handuk and we like the Minister of Information, uh, they don't really have sovereignty over the economy, of course, and the military. So, uh, you know, that's just the fact. So Sudanese, if you talk to them, who will tell you that it's still it's, there's, you know, we don't see a civilian Madania government. Uh, and so we have to not only be vigilant, but be very clear about that. And there has to be very, very clear, um, you know, policies now with, in conjunction with the international community for serious uh, security reform. You know, this is a very militarized country and a military that is um, really in command. And so I think that focusing on that is important. I think that settling the insurgent groups is a very, very good start. Right? You know, peace agreements with the insurgent groups, uh, bringing them into the government, they will represent a very strong voice against the gradual kind of demilitarization of the state that is put, bring, taking the military back into the barracks. Yeah. Just very briefly, I know we've overstayed our welcome, <laughs> 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 no, but I just want to say one thing about the Skundi's second question, which I think is also related to Kush uh, question. I think if Sudan does not address its identity crisis, I think we will be here again next year and the year after and for a long time. <laughs> Thank you. And just like with um, <laughs> as a nation. Uh, but uh, but for Mesut's question, just like you know, Tuhari said, you know, democracy is really the journey. It's not the destination. We're not trying to exhale. And Yusuf asked a very controversial question, which I will not answer right now. So uh, one, yeah, go ahead. Just yeah, a yeah. diaspora question. Again, I, I think it answers also a bit of uh, Koskondi's question. The diaspora is engaging Congress, not just on the front of um, the revolution and what's happening there and how to engage on the ground in Sudan, whether in terms of capacity building and so on, but also how to empower and um, engage the Sudanese here, particularly within the TPS. I'm happy to discuss a bit further and even connect you with that group that's working on that uh, a bit later. And then you. building on that, <coughs> again, you have the diaspora organizing in clusters, going back with their capacity buildings, with their workshops, with their trainings, and a lot of them is to deal with 
who are we, what are we, what are we trying to do, how are we going to do it, and what does each one of us bring to the table. Again, emphasizing that all these differences that we have, whether in upbringing or where we are in the world or where we were forced to go in the world because of this um, demonic regime, um, are all elements of strength that we're bringing back to Sudan. So, uh, briefly, one last word with regard to, <laughs> with, with regard to democratic transition. Uh, I think uh, we need to move uh, beyond the famous literature on transitology. Uh, there is no such thing called uh, democratic uh, means transition and then democratic consolidation as a linear process. Means everything could happen during this process, happen in Tunisia, still like a country transition and democratically. Uh, another uh, issue uh, with regard like, to uh, revolution or uprising in, in Mauritania or other countries, uh, I go back to uh, another context of uh, uh, Hobsman, who published like his excellent book in 1962, uh, talking uh, about the French Revolution. Each revolution has at least two main element specificity, at least geographic specificity, and has accumulation. And this accumulation happened in Tunisia, happened in Algeria, happened in Sudan. So those are two elements that we have to take into consideration, and accumulation is a long, long process. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. And uh, I would like to thank our panelists for their uh, insightful presentation. Thank you.